a lot I could say about that, but I'm just going to move on. If you have a Bible, if you turn to Ephesians chapter 4, we are in the fourth of a five-part series called God's Perfectly Imperfect Church. How do you know that you're in God's perfectly imperfect church? How do you know that you're part of what's perfect and you're part of what's imperfect? <laughs> we are perfectly imperfect people and together we're a perfectly imperfect church. As every day, uh, for those of us that are here, those of us that aren't here, and we're also part of the regional Central Coast Perfectly Imperfect Church. We're also part of the global Perfectly Imperfect Church. And what I've been trying to share with you the last three weeks and what I hope to share with you this morning is that God designed his church, his people, to be perfectly imperfect. Now I know that may push against some of your theology because you're like, no, no, we're, we're perfect in Christ. Yes, in Christ, but in practice, we're not. And he wants us to practice loving each other in a perfectly imperfect environment. How do you know it would be so easy to love each other if everyone was perfect, right? Every marriage would be so easy, every family would be so, if the kids were perfectly obedient and they followed the rules and parents just always said the right thing to their kids, the kids always said the right, I mean, it would be so easy, but it's hard because we're imperfect, we're broken, we have issues, we have stuff. And that's the way God allowed it to be. Yes, it's true, in the original design, there was no sin in the garden, but that didn't last very long, did it? We messed it up. We, humanity, messed it up. And so God didn't throw away humanity. He said, I've got an answer. I've got a solution. I am going to redeem them, but they're gonna live in that imperfect imperfect world. You know, the earth, the Bible says that the earth is actually groaning for the manifestation of the sons and daughters of God. The earth is longing for perfection once again. But from the time of Genesis till the time that Jesus comes back, we're living in a perfectly imperfect world amongst a perfectly imperfect people. It's just the way it is. And so understanding how to be in that and relax in that and feel good about that is so important. And so I'm just gonna sort of recap what we've looked at. We talked about, there's a little chart I'm gonna show you. It's, uh, you can put that up. Uh, go ahead and put that, I think there's a chart. Is there a chart? Did I, I didn't put that chart in there. Okay, well I'll just verbally recap it for you. Um, the first week we talked about the good of mixture. And that's from um, Matthew 13, and it's the parable of the wheat and the tares. And it's that God sowed a field of wheat, and the enemy came and put tares, which are weeds, basically, that look like wheat, in the middle of the field. And the worker said, should we rip out the weeds, which is a logical thing to ask, right? And the, but, the, but the master, the owner of the field said, nope, don't do that, because that could damage the wheat. So let it all grow together. And it's interesting, that is the will of God. God's will was not that tares would be sown, right? He didn't, the enemy did that. But once it was done, God said, let it all grow together. And that's the world we live in, and that's actually the church that we live in. A bunch of imperfection in the midst of us. Like, I know that you're perfect, but around you could be some tares. Like, you're, you're a perfect strand of wheat, but somewhere nearby, maybe two rulers over and three seats back, there could be a tear. And God said, let us grow together. Now, the goal is that we'd all become perfect stalks of wheat, but on the way there, it is what it is. Does that make sense? And, or, or maybe you're the tear. Ooh, that's a terrible thought, huh? A terrible thought. Did you get that? Yeah. Thank you. That means a lot. Thank you, Chuck. Then the next week I talked about the grace to relax, that God, it's interesting, 1 Corinthians 1 says that he, he chose, it says he actually picked a bunch of people that were broken to bring together and to make into the church. So I'm not saying you're broken, but somewhere in this room there's some broken people and that's okay, like God made it that way. He didn't pick all the rock stars, he picked just sort of average people that have issues and. He, he wants it that way. So it allows us to relax because 
Maybe we're those people. Maybe we're the ones that are imperfect. Maybe we are the ones that are broken. And so we can relax because, again, it's not, it's not just staying in your brokenness. That's not the point. The point is, is that whatever starting place you find yourself in is perfectly fine. It's, it's okay. Like we can walk into the doors of God's people just as we are, without one plea. Amen? And then last week I talked about the goals that unify. I know whenever you use the word goals, people get terrified. Uh, So that might have been a terrifying talk for you. But really what I was just trying to say is that when we move together, when when we align together as a perfectly imperfect people, it begins to unify us. And uh, one example that we talked about is just, just becoming more outward. And, I, and it, it's gonna take us a little while to become more outward, but I wanna encourage you to make it your goal. And, and again, this is guilt-free. This is not, um, this is not guilt-driven. This is desire-driven. Like, Lord, make me a person who's able to see outward. So I've got my stuff, I've got my stuff I'm dealing with, but don't let that make me inward you know, sort of us for and no more. Don't let me be a person that all I do is circle the wagons and sort of live inside of my, my campfire. Make me a person who reaches outside of my circle, outside of my sphere of influence, and bring others in because there's a whole world that needs Jesus. Amen? And guess what? We're the messengers. We are the ones that are carrying good news. And then today, what I want to talk with you about is the growth that changes the growth that changes. So, I don't know how you feel about this. I'm, I'm a change agent. I love change. Well, I used to love change. I don't love change as much as I used to. But I like to see things progress. Like, I like to see, if it starts here, I like to see it go further. I, I love that. That's something about that that really delights me. And how many of you know that nothing could be more boring than to never progress? Like God should be the only one that's unchanging. And the rest of us should be growing, going from glory to glory, you know, progressing, moving. Because that's how God designed us. And so I don't mean constant chaos and change, I just mean moving forward, going someplace together. And so life is really boring when you look at your life and you look in the mirror and you're like, gosh, I'm exactly the same as I was last year. Same same thought patterns, same habits, same, everything's the same. And it's, and it's not to put ourselves down, it's to look at ourselves and go, gosh, it can be different, it can be better. The phrase, one of the many phrases in scripture is 2 Corinthians 3.18 says that we go from glory to glory, right? We can go from whatever level of glory, if you will, that you're at right now, you can go higher, you can go farther you can increase. Amen. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Wherever you are, where's Brian? I hear your voice, oh, there you are. And the truth is, is that we can change together. And we're gonna talk about that today. Like, how does change actually occur? How does growth happen? And so we're gonna look at that in Ephesians And this is a very familiar passage, but I am going to put it on the screen for you. Verses 7 through 16, uh, this is is an edited version to help with clarity, okay? So I'm going to put it on the screen for you, and I'm going to read it. I, I might have changed a few words, so it may not match exactly, but here we go. Through Christ's gift, each of us has received a measure of grace. This is why scripture says, when he ascended to heaven, he conquered people's bondage and he gave people gifts. Verse nine, before he ascended to heaven, he first descended to earth. The one who descended is now far above the earth and sky where he rules over everything. Verse 11, he graced some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. Verse 12, to equip the saints for serving and to strengthen the entire body of Christ. Verse 13, until we all walk in unity around our faith and in our knowledge of God's Son, so that together we become mature and can display Christ's fullness. Verse 14, when that happens, 
We will no longer be tossed around like little kids by the winds. That, that actually, that Greek word for little kids literally means infants. It means like, you know, an infant is helpless. So to be tossed around is like you got no, you can't anchor yourself, you can't root yourself, you can't grab a tree trunk. You're just being taught, can you imagine just be like a little baby being tossed around in the ocean? That's the idea. That God doesn't want us to be helpless like that. He wants us to be rooted and grounded and strong. When that happens, we will no longer be tossed around like little kids by the winds and waves of human doctrines and deceptions. Instead, as we speak the truth in love, we will grow up into every dimension of Christ who is our head. The entire body comes together perfectly in him as he provides for every connection and as he instructs each of us how to work properly within his body, resulting in the growth and strength of the entire body because of love. I wanna share three, I don't, I don't really like this kind of term, but I'm gonna share it anyway. Three growth secrets, okay, because and the reason I'm saying secrets is not to be dramatic, it's because I think sometimes we miss the obvious. Like they're not secrets like God's trying to hide them from us, but they're secrets like we miss it. And so the very first one is this. This is a faith one. You ready? It's super simple. We can grow. I don't know about you, but there are different times in my life where I have become disillusioned, jaded, cynical, hopeless, discouraged, and thought, I can't grow, we can't grow, we're not growing. And just sort of gave up my faith. Uh, now you guys look so saintly, I can even see halos on most of you. <laughs> but do any of you relate to what I'm saying? Do you ever feel a little bit like, wow, I don't feel like I'm growing or it doesn't seem like things around me are growing. You know, how, you know how it feels? It's not a good feeling. My spouse isn't growing, I'm not growing, my kids aren't growing, my parents aren't growing, my friends aren't growing, my coworkers aren't growing. But I believe that one of the secrets to growth is believing that we can grow. You and I and we together can grow. It is possible for us to grow. If we haven't been growing, it's possible to start growing today, right now. We can literally grow. I'll give you an example. If we haven't been believing that statement and we decide to believe it, because faith is a decision first, it's not a feeling, it's a decision. If we decide to believe that statement, you have already grown. Your faith just grew just a little bit. The Bible says we've each been given a measure of faith and that faith can increase. Remember what the disciples said to Jesus? Please, Jesus, increase our faith. And what did Jesus do? He lowered the bar. He said, hey guys, if you have faith that's like a mustard seed, if you have a little bit of faith, you can move mountains. We can grow. Growth starts by believing God. God is promising in this passage that we can grow. He brings up growth several times. So let me just show you five big promises about our growth that are in the passage we just read. They're in Ephesians 4, 7 through 16. You ready? The first one is we can become mature. The Greek word for mature is teleos. It literally means complete. We can become so mature that we're complete, meaning there's not an area of deficiency. So if you think about our character, okay? You guys ready for this? Our character is like an old, you know those old uh, water barrels or wine barrels? You know, they have staves in them and then they have a metal ring at the top and a metal ring at the bottom. You guys familiar with that? Imagine that that's our character or that's our life, let's say. And each of those staves is an aspect of our character. The water can only go as high as the lowest stave. So if there's an area in our life or two 
that are doing really well and those staves go all the way to the top of the barrel, but there's some that are sort of broken, they're broken halfway down, that's as high as the water can fill our barrel. So when, the pro- when, it, when there's a promise in the Bible that says we can become teleos, it means complete. Every stave goes all the way to the top. There's no leakage. There's no deficiency. There's no area where the enemy can breach the wall. I mean, that is a beautiful, beautiful promise. We can become mature, you guys. Again, today just starts, the first one just starts with believing. I want to encourage you to say that even to yourself. I'm not trying to get you to do anything for me, but just say that to yourself. I can become mature. It's not, it's not, an, it's not a uh, far off, impossible aspiration. It's, it's within our grasp. We can become mature. Here's another one. We can display Christ's fullness. This is, I mean, this one blows my mind. We can not only become mature, we can display, the Bible says we can display the fullness of Christ. It's verse 13, so that together we become mature and can display Christ's fullness. You and I, there is the possibility, there is, it is available to us to take all of who Jesus is and put him on display through our lives. I'm not saying we're doing that right now. I'm saying it's possible for us to fully display Christ. If you want a truth that'll get you outside of your own headspace quickly, that's it. You can display the fullness of who Jesus is. You, I, we. That's phenomenally amazing to me. Okay, someday somebody's gonna be as excited as I am about this stuff. Here's another one. This is also another truth that you can believe. You, we can grow. We can become mature. We can display Christ's fullness. We can stop being tossed around. Do you remember that phrase where it says, you know, the infants? Like, we don't have to be unstable. How many of you know the Bible says, what's it say? I'm, trying, I'm thinking of uh, James chapter one. It talks about being tossed and driven by the wind. No, it's the one that says there's something about uh, something man is unstable in all his ways. It's a, he, who he who doubts. Unbelief makes us get tossed around. Unbelief doesn't have to look like, I don't believe you, God. It can look like indecision. I'm not sure I believe you, God. Hello? Have you ever been in a place of unbelief? James chapter one says that when we doubt, when we, remember what Peter was, Peter was literally, Jesus told him, come to me. He literally walked on water. And what, what did it take for him to sink? All he did was get his eyes off Jesus and look down. He entered into doubt. Now, I, I know that that's easy to go, well, of course. And, but you don't have to lower the bar. We can keep our eyes on Jesus and walk on water. We really can. It's not a myth, it's true. And of course, mostly we'll walk on water there are people that have walked on physical water, by the way. Mel Tari, he's been here, he's on our board. He has seen people, I think he also, but he's seen, did he walk on water too? I think he and his friends literally walked on water. They were able to cross, I think they were able to cross, yeah, they got across a river or something. During, during the Indonesian revival in the 1960s, yeah, they walked on water. So it's happened throughout history with eyewitnesses, eyewitness accounts. But more importantly is walking on emotional water, walking on relational water, walking on spiritual water, right? We don't have to be tossed around. Here's another one. We can grow up in every dimension of Christ. We can be just like Jesus. Now I know that's a stretch for a lot of us. We're like, I'm so far from being just like Jesus. But it's possible for you and I to be just like Jesus. I'm not saying we are yet. I'm saying it's possible. I'm saying there's an invitation from God in Ephesians chapter four, verses seven through 16, to be just like Jesus. That ought to give us a little bit of pause. Not to beat up on ourselves, but to go, wow. 
Is it possible, really? I could be just like Jesus? I'm not talking about growing a beard or wearing sandals or a robe. I'm talking about his nature, his character. I mean, when I look at stuff like this, I immediately think how far I am from being just like Jesus. Do you guys think that at all? Do you ever think, be just like Jesus? My goodness, that would take like uh, 10 miracles. But, maybe so. But the possibility exists, and even more so, the invitation exists to become just like him. And I don't know how life fully works. I know that I think God is pleased as we go on that journey, as we're moving towards becoming like Jesus. I personally believe, do you know what Romans 8 says? That there's a lot of talk about destiny. What's my destiny? You know what it says? It says we've been predestined, so we have a destiny already laid out for us to be conformed to the image of Christ. We have a destiny to become just like Jesus. Like God has set us on a pathway to become like Jesus. And sometimes we wonder why there's trials. We wonder why we have to take the same test over and over. We wonder why we keep having the same dysfunctional relationships. It's because he wants us to become like Jesus. And he lets us retake the test until we pass. Because he's trying to graduate us. His goal isn't to get us to fail. His goal is to get us to pass. But to pass, we have to pass. Like we don't, he doesn't just go, ah, no big deal. He's like, no, I want you to grow in this area. Last one is, and it does feel a little repetitive, but it's all related to each other. We can grow and become strong. And this is kind of a big deal. Like there's a verse in, uh, in the Bible that says, let the weak say, I am strong. God's desire is that we could acknowledge that we're weak, acknowledge where we're weak, and then become strong. Let the weak say. It's not let the strong say. So it's not about being fake. It's about being real, but not so real that you stay in your weakness. It's about let the weak, I'm weak, I admit it to myself and to others, I'm weak. But let the weak say, let them declare and let it be true of them, I am strong in the Lord. I'm strong in the Lord. I, my reality has changed. I used to be weak in this area, but now I am strong. How do you know that we can be strong and then regress and become weak and then get strong again in the same area? Anybody want to raise a hand of testimony and say, yep, I've done that before? Yeah. So anyway, here's, these, are, these are five areas that we can... Let's, let's just consider these. Um, I'm going to consider the first one for just a minute. We can become mature. Let me just look at that for a second. Have you ever been told you're being a baby? I have. I've said it. I've heard it. But more importantly, has it ever been true? Have you been a baby? Yeah. We've all been babies at times. We've all been immature. We've thrown tantrums. We've had fits of rage. So then that begs the question, well, what is maturity? What does it look like to be mature? If it's not being a baby, what does it look like to be mature? I'm going to just give you a little bit of Google search, all right? Psychology Today says maturity is the behavioral expression and of emotional health and wisdom. Merriam-Webster says maturity is full development. The Cambridge Dictionary says maturity is the quality of behaving mentally and emotionally like an adult. It doesn't say what an adult is, but it says behaving like an adult. We could also just summarize it and say maturity is being like Christ. That would be true. Uh, maturity is love. We could say that. That would be true. We could say maturity is uh, displaying the nature and the, and, the, and the character of Christ. That would be true, right? So each of these could be unpacked. Can you imagine displaying Christ's fullness to stop being tossed around, to become strong? What a beautiful invitation in the realm of promise. All of these things are promised to us. So the very first growth secret is to believe we can grow, okay? Here's the second one. We can grow together. This is big. This is super big. It's not just we can grow together, 
we do grow together. So there's two different kinds of growth, beloved. There's personal growth and there's together growth. You guys with me? There's personal growth where it's me, myself, and I, the three of us hang out together and we grow. Yeah? We can read, we can reflect, we can pray, we can journal, we can set goals, we can schedule ourselves. And all these things we can definitely grow. Personal growth has limits. You cannot grow fully by yourself. It's impossible. You can grow some by yourself. You can, especially in the realm of habits and talents, you can definitely grow in habits and talents by yourself. And there's a lot, like, like professional athletes, they grow in their craft, in their, you can grow in your, your industry or your gifting or your job by yourself. You could sit at a cubicle and get better and better at what you do. All of that's possible and all of that's admirable. It's beautiful. But you can't grow in patience by yourself. You can't grow in peace by yourself. There are monks that have tried it. They seemed so peaceful till someone came and rattled their cage and then all that peace was gone. All that 10 years of meditating was gone. Because it's not peace until it's tested in adversity. It's not love until it's tested in the battle of humanity. It's, it's, it's just words if it doesn't occur in real life, in real relationship. Does that make sense? Do you know the world we live in, and I don't want to harp on this, I just want to mention it because I think you guys already know this, you're probably maybe more aware of it than I am, but do you know that the digital world has produced a group of people on earth, that would be us and all the people around us, who have become thinner and thinner skinned. Why? Because in the old days before digital equipment, if we wanted to unfriend someone, we had to go talk to them. Now we can literally click a button. We don't ever have to engage them at all. In fact, they don't even have to know that, they'll know later, but they don't even know in the moment that you unfriended them. You just unfriend them. We are the ultimate cancel culture right now because we can do so many things by the push of a button. Does anybody hear what I'm saying? You can quit almost anything through a text. You know that just doing the cafe, so I'm, my daughter managed the cafe, I'm functional owner, now I'm managing it. But I was involved with her managing it for the whole year, and now I'm definitely involved with it. And do you know that I have had a number of people give notice via text with no two weeks notice. Like, hey, I'm just sending you my resignation letter. It's a text. I'm sending my resignation letter. I won't be coming in anymore. Like, I'm like, what? I have you scheduled all week for shifts. Like, you're quitting through a text with no conversation today? And the answer is absolutely, with no, no apology. Not even like, I feel bad. And I'm shocked, I'm like, I cannot believe the culture that we live in. And this is not me or greenhouse or every, it's, it's everywhere. It's the craziest thing that's happened. And yet, think about this, even though it's become super easy to disengage and quit and cancel, there's more anxiety than there's ever been. There's more panic attacks than there's ever been, why? Because if anyone dares to push back, <gasps> we fall apart. You know why, you know, do you know what makes roots of a tree get strong and go deep? It's, it's the adversity, it's the wind and the waves that make it strong. It's like, it, as long as you don't have a storm that completely uproots the tree, that tree's gonna get stronger, why? Because when the wind tries to push it, the roots go, and they go down deeper. If there's no wind, this, the, you can just pull it out, there's nothing there. We are entering into a very strange digital world where the root system of so many lives is not very deep because there's no challenge because we've eradicated challenge digitally. People can quit marriages, jobs, friendships through a text. Over the past year, just working in the cafe, I've watched people cancel boyfriend-girlfriend relationships of like a year through a single text. Hey, just wanna let you know I'm breaking up with you. Bye. I'm like, you can't do that, but they do. (laughs) 
So here's the thing. We can grow together. Let me show you the same promises as they're written in Ephesians 4. I, 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 I parsed them out last time, but let's just look at them again. Go ahead and just hit them all. Together, we become mature. Together, we display Christ's fullness. Together, we stop being tossed around. Together, we become just like Jesus. Together, we grow and become strong. That's actually what the text says. It says we do all that together. Let me just read you a little bit. Until we all walk in unity, until we all walk in unity around our faith and in our knowledge of God's Son, so that together we become mature, and together we display Christ's fullness. As we speak the truth in love, we will grow up into every dimension of Christ. You see, the Bible says that the promises of all this growth and all this Christ likeness occur together. And so what do you think's happening right now if the world's becoming more and more detached and digital? People are experiencing less and less opportunity to grow because growth has to happen together. This isn't, this isn't just a, some sort of plea to come to church on Sunday. This is like actually how life works, beloved. This is, this is real. Like, I need you in my life, and you need me in your life for us to actually become more like Jesus. We have to have each other, mostly to encourage each other, but also to challenge each other at times, but mostly to encourage, honestly. We mostly just need support and encouragement. We can grow together. Okay, last, last one, I'm gonna finish with this. So how does all this happen? Okay, we can grow, we can grow together. Third big secret truth, we can grow together as we connect, communicate, and contribute. This is straight from verse 15, 16. 15 and 16. 14, 15, and 16, somewhere in there. <laughs> we can grow together as we connect, communicate, and contribute. So, here, here's the, I'm just gonna go back. Can, can you, are you able, um, Kendall, to jump back to the scripture and then go back to this? Okay, skip back to that scripture. I just want you to see this. The last verse, the entire body comes together perfectly in him. So, now keep, in context, keep the context. We're coming together, so that means we're together. We're in the same space which is why gatherings are so important. That's why it says don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together because it's when we come together that this stuff happens. It's in the togetherness. Okay, the entire body comes together perfectly in him as he provides for every connection. In some translations it says what every joint supplies. What that means is, if you look at it in the Greek, it means like the, the rotator cuff, like the, the elbow joint, it's where Two things come together, tendons and bones and muscles come together in that spot. It is prayer groups, small groups, teams that work together. It literally means when we come together and function, this is where we grow, right here. You can't do it by your, that's the stuff you can't do by yourself because it takes what every joint supplies. A joint means two or more coming together. Like that is literally where we grow. Like if you wanted to go get some muscles, let's say you're gonna do push-ups or you're gonna do bench press, you're gonna have to engage your pectoral muscles, your arm muscles, your forearms, your hands, your back muscles, your shoulder muscles, your abs are all gonna be involved, all these muscles and, and tendons and sinews are gonna come together and that's where the growth is gonna happen. The entire body comes together as he provides. So what happens is if we'll come together, he'll provide for the connection. If we'll hang out together, if we'll work together, if we'll serve together, if we'll function together, he puts grace on that connection. He causes, he puts, 
He pours miracle grow on our togetherness. That's really what that verse means. When we come together, he pours miracle grow on it. And then what else does he do? He instructs each of us how to work properly. In other words, it's when we come together that he starts teaching us. This is how you speak to someone else. This is what you do when there's a conflict. This, he starts instructing us because he can't instruct us in a vacuum. He has to use real life examples like, hey, do you remember when she said that and it hurt your feelings? Let me tell you how to get healthy in the midst of that. He instructs us in real world situations that involve coming together. You can't just read a book about it. You can. That's what you can do by yourself. That's beautiful. But then we have to practice in real life with real people who make us mad and hurt our feelings and don't understand us and don't get us and we miss each other. That is where this stuff happens and also where we encourage each other and we strengthen each other and we listen to each other and we empathize with each other and we're there for each other. All of it is the together. Does this make any sense at all? We connect. And then I love what verse 15 says. It says, oh, go, but stay, okay, yeah, go, stay, blah, 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 blah. Uh, just guess the best you can, yeah, you're doing good. Okay, before you go there, okay, so uh, instead, as we speak the truth in love, so we communicate, now you can go to communicate, go, quickly go to communicate, go. Good job, isn't she amazing? Let's give her a hand. So we connect, right, we, we connect in real life situations as God's people, a small group connects. You don't, have, it's not, you don't have to do a job. You can just connect because you have people over for dinner is connection. Have a dialogue. Get to know each other. That's connection. It doesn't have to involve work. But work is one context. Hanging out is another context. Praying together is a context. Anytime we come together and do anything, there's the opportunity to become more like Jesus. Are we tracking? Some of which you can do by yourself, but not all. Some of it has to be done together. And then when we communicate, I love this, speaking the truth in love. How many of you know, how, how many, if you had to just raise your hands, I want you to just pick one or the other. How many of you are better at speaking the truth than speaking in love? That would be me. Uh -huh. You're better at the truth than love part. Just raise, hold them high, don't be ashamed. Oh, well, you can be a little ashamed, but not too ashamed. Okay, how many of you do the love part more, better than the truth part? You kind of couch the truth and you hide the truth and you don't really want to say it. Yeah, okay. The Bible says that Jesus in John 1.18, he was full of grace and truth. He was full of the love and full of the truth. The Pharisees probably thought he was full of truth without love because he made them mad. But then the woman caught in adultery thought, he barely said any truth to me, he just loved me but he also said, go and sin no more, right? He told her the truth, but he loved her so well. Jesus was perfect at speaking the truth in love. We are not. Some of us are better at the truth part, some of us are better at the love part. That's why we need each other, because if I'm better at the truth than the love and you're better at the tr love than the truth, we're gonna help each other grow. Even if we don't say a word to each other, we just model for each other. As I speak the truth, and I watch you love, I learn how to love better. As you love and you watch me speak the truth, you learn how to speak the truth better. It doesn't even have to involve conflict, it's just being together helps everyone grow. Does this make sense? And then lastly, we contribute. Like, there's something powerful about using our gifts. Now, can you swing back to that scripture again, the whole, the, the first scripture? Okay, look at what it says. Through Christ's gift, each of us has received a measure of grace. That word grace is charis. It's the same Greek word that means gifts. It means each of us has been given something. Gifts are not trophies, they're tools. They're not for ourselves, they're for others. That means you've been given grace for other people. So you have grace from God for you, for sure. But in this context, that grace that God has given you is for other people. It's, it's, it's a tool. It means God has given you something to contribute. And I don't just mean contribute on a church team, I mean contribute in the body, like you are meant to contribute something because you have something. Hello? 
When he ascended, he gave people gifts. He gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Now, I'm not saying every one of the, you know, all of us are at least one of those five, but I will say that we all have at least one of those five tendencies. Some of us are kind of teacher types. We, we like to instruct, we're analytical, kind of careful about right and wrong, what's in bounds, what's out of bounds. We just, we think in terms of rules, perhaps. Others of you, us, are very pastoral. We're, we want to just protect and care for the flock. We want to make sure everyone's safe and loving each other and getting fed and very pastoral, right? Some of us are very evangelistic. We're very outward. We're constantly thinking, how can I reach people in my community? How can we get more people in the church? How, that's your gift. You're, you're evangelistic. You're, we need you. You know, only 5 to 7% of the body of Christ are truly evangelistic. That's why we need them so badly because most of, us are, most of us are more pastoral, to be honest with you. The majority of the body of Christ is pastoral, believe it or not. Some of us are prophetic. We're, we're very much, we're black and white. We, we have a lot of revelation flowing. We tend to have discernment. We can be wrong because it can enter into suspicion, but a lot of times we actually know motives. We've got to be careful not to accuse people of motives, but sometimes we know what's going on behind the scenes. We can see. We can see. We get revelation. There's seers and prophets and dreamers and artists. And, and then there's apostolic people that are builders. They, they know how to build. They know how to get something going. A lot of times they're, they're the ones that are in the trenches getting their hands cut on the, on the rebar and the, they're digging the trenches and they're pouring the foundation and it's dirty and it's messy, but they're building. They see the cracks. They see the foundation. They build. And I'll bet you if we took a, a gift test, you would emerge with one or two of those ahead of the other ones. Like you might be a apostolic teacher, like Bill Johnson. You might be a teaching apostle. So you know what I mean? You can be a combo. What do you think you are, Aaron? What do you think you're? Yeah, I think you have the apostolic and the teacher thing. I don't know what order, but yeah, those two would emerge. What do you think, Melissa? What do you, what do you think you're, if we just pick two, let's say? Uh, prophet for sure and teacher. Prophetic teacher or teaching prophet or something, something, something in there. What about you, Malachi? How would you? What she said, but switched. Okay, so just the opposite. That's interesting that, you, that prophetic is so strong on both of you. That's amazing. And that's, yeah. So isn't this fun, though? Because what you're seeing is you're seeing people get in touch with, and, and some of us have taken gift tests. We've been aware of this for years. Others of us, this would be like a new discovery. But how important is it to know that we've been given something to contribute as we come together? Like, and the thing is, is that if I'm not very pastoral, I need pastoral people around me because I'm gonna miss a bunch of stuff. But pastoral people tend to not have a lot of discernment. They're just busy loving and, and the enemy can beat them up. But we need prophets next to the pastors, even though sometimes those people don't get along. We need them together because there needs to be discernment and care. Discerning care is what we need. Does this make sense? And this is how we contribute, beloved. We get in touch with who we are, we find a place to serve, and we begin to use our gifts and let other people use their gifts, and we all grow together. And, we, and the Bible says we fill up what is lacking in the affliction of Christ. Like we fill it up with our gifts. Our gifts and our talents and our care begin to fill up whatever's lacking. Let me just show you a little illustration of some things that every day that we're, we're doing right now. We've got Kingdom Kids. Of course, you guys know that. We've got Everyday Student Ministries. I, don't, I didn't have their logo, but that's one that I just made. Um, we've got this thing that we're doing. It's not really clear. It says house to house. It just means what we do in each other's homes, you know, where we, we have prayer times, praise times, process times, and party times. We want that really to develop. Everyday Food Pantry, we're trying to get that going again. Our Sunday celebration is based on Acts 2.46 and 5.42. It says every day, 
in the temple courts and house to house, they gathered together and they broke bread and they hung out and they burnt the church. They did it in the, in the homes and they did it in the big temple courts. So this is our temple court meeting, right? We have a welcome team, we have a worship team, production team, ministry team, there's other teams I just mentioned. Those are just four that would fit on the slide. But there's a lot of places for you to use your gift. If you have a gift of, uh, gosh, you could almost have any gift and help Eric set up for Sunday morning. That would be amazing. So he doesn't have to do it all himself, you know? And then we have the transformation team. We have character formation coaching groups that Aaron has inaugurated in our midst. At, and we have, now we have tons of coaches and qualified people. It's really amazing. And uh, Roberta and Chris, restoring the foundations, issue focused times. So it's just, and there's more. There's just a ton that we're doing. And we're not even doing that much, but we're doing enough where you could plug in and actually serve in a way that would be really meaningful with your gift. Our worship team, Daniel and Sam, are expanding right now. It's wonderful to see new people serving. And of course, we don't just serve in the church teams or church building. We serve in our community. We serve with our family. We serve in our neighborhoods. Like all of it is serving. It's, it's using our gifts to grow together. But it's especially important that we do it with the body of Christ. Really important. How does this make sense? I'm gonna finish with this. How does this make sense with the perfectly imperfect church? You see, as we recognize that we're perfectly imperfect, we realize that we're qualified to contribute because everyone is perfectly imperfect, which means my gift could possibly help because nobody's perfect and nobody's got it together, so I'm qualified to contribute what I have to give, and so are you. And as I contribute, as I connect, and as I communicate, and as I contribute, we get to grow together so we become less imperfect, if you will, and we make more room for more imperfect people to come. The goal is that more people would become more like Christ so we can bring in more people who are broken, and they can become more like Christ so we can bring in more people who are broken who can become like Christ. It happens as we do it together. We can grow together, beloved, if we'll connect and communicate and contribute. So here's some ways, by the way, if you're not part of a team and you're not using your gifts, here's some ways you can do that. Contact myself, Cheryl, Sam, Daniel, Sam, one of the elders, anybody that you wanna talk to, we wanna help you connect and serve and contribute because it's so important because that's how we grow together. Does this make sense? Thank you for listening. Thank you for caring. Thank you for taking every word that's been said, applying it 100% to your life from this day forward forever. Thank you for that. I'm just gonna close in prayer. Father, I wanna thank you that you love everyday church. You love all the churches on the Central Coast that lift up the name of your son, Jesus. And you love this church. And we bless everyday church, God. We bless this perfectly imperfect family. And we pray, God, that we would grow together. Show us how to grow together. Lord, would you motivate us? Would you lead us? Would you help us, God? Would you encourage us? Would you strengthen us? to become a people that truly grow together, that we could reach more and more people for you. In the name of Jesus, and everyone said amen. 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 God bless you, have an amazing week. If you want prayer, grab someone next to you, or there'll be a few people up here as well. Um, have a great day. <laughs>